Welcome back to the Policy Viz Podcast. I'm your host, John Schwabish. On this week's episode of the show, I chat with Julia Silge. Julia works at R Studio. So if you are familiar with the R programming language, I'm sure you know Julia. I'm sure you know of her work. She was one of the earlier developers of the Tidy Models package, and she's working on a whole bunch of other things right now. And she has two books that have come out over the last year or so, one on Tidy Models, one on text analysis, As I mentioned in the first episode of this season, text is going to be a theme that you're going to hear more and more about over the course of the season. So Julie and I talk a little bit, actually not a little bit, a lot of bit, about visualizing qualitative data and the challenges that come with that. So you'll want to hear about that. You'll also want to hear about the new package Vetiver that Julie and her team have been working on about machine learning and sort of uh, putting those models out into the world, actually uh, getting them to work uh, in real scenarios, in real situations. So uh, I hope you'll enjoy this week's episode of the show. And here's my conversation with Julia. Hey, Julia, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited to chat with you. We've been emailing for a while. I'm super excited. You have all sorts of stuff going on. Like in general, like I'm sure in addition to your regular busy schedule, you also have like two books out like now, which is pretty incredible. I don't know how you do two books and work and life stuff (laughs) all at the same time. Um, So... I thought maybe you could tell folks a little bit about yourself, and then we talk a little bit about each of these new books, but then we'll spend a bulk of our time talking about um, this new work that you're doing, and I'm not going to mention it now. I'm going to save it for a little bit. Get people to like, (laughs) keep that play button going so they have to- Wow, what 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 are they going to talk about? What are they going to be talking about? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so I'm really happy to be here. My name is Julia. Um, So my title now is- um, uh, software engineer. Oh. Um, I'm a software engineer at our studio. When I introduce myself, I often say I'm like data scientist and software engineer, right. you know, because people, um, you know, these, there's certain different kinds of tasks and kinds of skills that, um, that I often think about and talk about and write about kind of has that overlap yeah. there. But yeah, yeah I've been, so I've been at our studio for uh, coming up on three years, mm-hmm. two and a half to three years. Okay. Um, uh, I've been there for about, for about that long. Yeah. And it's been, um, I mean, I mean, no shock, right? Like it's been a really amazing yeah. experience working, working at our studio. I, it was, it's interesting because it is the first time that my, you know, my title has been software engineer and that my, uh, the focus of like, let's say all of my time or most of my time is on tool building. Mm -hmm. I think I'm someone who's um, always been very interested in like people's really practical um, like workflows, like how do they do things? And I've, I've been involved in tool building either open source or internally, Mm. you know, at places I worked for a while, but it is pretty interesting to be, to now be kind of focused on that full time and less, less as a daily sort of practitioner, I guess, of, the kind of um, using the kind of tools that now I focus on building. And I would guess, I mean, even though you've done open source stuff in the past, I would guess R is kind of different in in the fact that like there's so much of a community where there's so much openness around it. Like the one thing you build has like 40 other things that add on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, um, I actually, uh, was not involved in the open source community before oh, R. Okay. I, yeah. So my, so my, you know, my academic background is physics and astronomy, and my, I, my, my computational background at that point was was um just, was all C, you oh, know, okay. just like yeah. plain old plain old C. <laughs> and um, I, you know, partly for data analysis pipelines mm-hmm. coming out of a telescope, and partly for um what we now call like embedded kind of work, like to write software to run on the the camera mm-hmm. uh, on the um on, on the telescope oh, to write, you know, the software that does the drivers, you know, like moves the little optical right. components around yeah. and that kind of thing. So the, the, now that's called like embedded gotcha. programming, I guess. Cool. Um, but so I, you know, I think at the time there, there must have been, open source communities, but I perceived them as scary and not for me, (laughs) you know, (laughs) what I perceived sort of thing. Yeah. Well, like it's like the Linux kernel people. Like that's, that's what I perceived open source as because I, you know, I mean, I think there's some reality to Mm -hmm. that both because of the time that it was then. And, um, 
and what those, you know, what those particular kind of communities are, are like. So I, um, I, I, I didn't see that as a place where I thought would be a good fit for me. And I didn't try and I wasn't interested, you know, like I wasn't, I, that wasn't something that I did before in my sort of pre, pre data science life. And, um, uh, and then kind of, you know, later in life when I've kind of made this like career yeah. change and, you know, first I started learning Python and then I found out about R and started learning it a bit too. And, and seeing what the, um, what the open source communities are like, yeah. especially R, I would say, especially R and being like, whoa, right. this is amazing. Yeah. You know, I really did when I was thinking about um, this transition and kind of like thinking, I think this would be a good fit for the things that I really like to do and okay, I'm going to learn these new, or that, I mean, not new, new to me, right, right, new to me at right. the time, yeah. <laughs> uh, programming languages that I had not dabbled in before. Um, I really kind of had this mental, this mental uh, attitude of, okay, it's time to, time to toughen up, yeah. time to gird my loins <laughs> and go back in there, you know, to, to like this kind of technical community. Yeah. But but my experience of it has been just, right. just the opposite, you know, just, just welcoming people excited about what you're doing, people interested in what, um, what kind of thing might you do? Also interested in, um, uh, let's call it, let's call it mentorship mm-hmm. or interested in like, oh, you, I see you built a package. Let me offer you resources right, right. for how you might be better yeah, at that. Yeah. You know, like how you might get better right. at that. So yeah, my, so, so actually, no, I, my, I really do not have open source history mm. besides, um, you know, besides art right. and data science technologies. So did you, um, and I do want to get to the other stuff, but but this is a it, your 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 like origin story is really interesting. So were you like when you're getting into Python and getting into R, sort of learning the open source world and learning the code? Is that what drew you to R Studio, or was that kind of like yeah, I now see this is a good positive community. I want to be a part of it, but that's sort of like added bonus, and I want to go to R Studio because of X Y Z. And do you mean go to our studio as in terms of like full time? Yeah, yeah, employment? I guess so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because because our studio as the IDE, I was like, man, yeah, I right, love this. Right. This is this is great. <laughs> right. This is way better than just using Emacs like I used to do. <laughs> Coding in Pine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So in terms of um, <clears throat> in terms of working on open source full time, yeah. uh, I it what you know honestly it wasn't really I wouldn't say it was a goal I had mm-hmm. or something that um I had on my radar as an option. Um I was interested in data science as a practice mm-hmm. and and I was interested in um building tools that make you know made my literal life better mm-hmm. but also could be reused by other people and, you know, we can make things better together. Um, And I, 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 you know, if you had asked me, what do you envision doing? I would say, oh, well, I'll probably, you know, be a data scientist and, you know, contribute to open source on the side. And I, you know, like the employers that I had, you know, over those kind of first couple jobs in data science were definitely employers who, you know, knew the value of open source and encouraged, um, encourage involvement mm-hmm. in open source software. So um, uh, it, it wasn't a situation where it's like, well, I will get in big trouble right, if I, right. you know, uh, you know, do anything for an open source project yeah. on the clock. It wasn't that kind of gotcha. situation, okay. you know? Yeah. Um, but I was, so I was, um, you know, I was working as a data scientist and kind of thinking about my next step and this, um, and, and our studio, po- you know, posted this job mm-hmm. about um, working on, um, uh, working on tidy models. So working okay. on tidy models. Uh, so, so what that really involves is like, not statistical methods, not like let's implement new methods, mm-hmm. but rather let's think about how do people go through the process of a model analysis? How can we build software to make the, you know a harmonious, 
less heterogeneous interface to many kinds of models? How can we build in statistical guardrails mm -hmm. to how people go about building machine learning models? And and I thought, oh, well, that is right up. That is right up my yeah. alley. Like I, I love working on that kind of thing. That's that's a little bit about process and a little bit about um practice. Mm -hmm. Uh of course, of course, like I am a mathy science person yeah, by back yeah, yeah. by background, but I am I am much more motivated by um by tools that are a little bit more around process and practice mm -hmm. than about say, let's invent a new statistical method that's gonna get this <laughs> tiny bit better <laughs> than the one before. Right. Like that's not right. super right. that's not super motivating to right. me. So so um you know, I applied to this job just like uh, any other person yeah. did. I wasn't the only person who applied. You know, they interviewed. So it was – so my process of getting a job at our studio was pretty much like getting, getting a, a job. Getting a yeah, job, right, you know. Right. Um, uh, it wasn't – what it, you know, I wasn't a, in a situation where they said, Julia, come. Right. We want to hire you. You know, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. Like I applied. I interviewed. Right. Okay. <laughs> I was I was lucky lucky enough I feel like yeah, to get yeah. offered that job and so um, I've been you know it's been really fantastic yeah. I'm really excited um, I do you know I I talk to people sometimes who I think um, maybe have an exaggerated idea of what it is like to work on open source mm -hmm. or maybe an unrealistic or rose colored glasses kind of idea. Like what is it like to work on open mm -hmm. source full time as a job? Because I do think for some people you're like, that sounds like the dream, right. the dream, yeah. you know? And I mean, the thing is, it is a job. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I've, I, it's a great job. Yeah, yeah. Like I enjoy it very much. I, it's a, it's, it's one that I, um, feel very fortunate to have, yeah. but it, it is, it is at the end of the day, um, a, a job, job. Yeah. you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's interesting to hear you talk about the workflow because it seems like all the stuff that we're going to talk about is definitely in that vein. And I would guess that the workflow around data and tech and coding has changed dramatically. I mean, even in the three years or so that you've been at our studio, the way people are working with data has changed. Um, Okay, so yeah. you've got two books coming out. You've got one book on tidy models, which you've already talked about. Now, I have Max, your co-author, Max Kuhn, is going to come on the show uh, later this season. So we don't need to dive into all that. He can do the sales job on tidy models. Um, you've also got this book on text analysis, which is really exciting. So I want to make sure that we get to your current work. So I'm going to ask you just one question on the text analysis book, and we'll leave the other all stuff right. on top. So I want to ask you... Do you think data analysis, data visualization is harder with qualitative data or with quantitative data? That's a great question. I think I think that um, a, a an important thing to realize about those though that sort of comparison, mm -hmm. that sort of um, hey, how do we think about? rectangular data versus unstructured data mm -hmm. is to realize that um, when it comes to computers, no matter what you're doing, you know, Python R, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever you're doing, um, for you to be able to summarize, visualize, or eventually train a machine learning model, you have to get that unstructured data, that qualitative data, mm -hmm. Um, into some kind of structure, structure yeah. into some kind of shape. Mm -hmm. Like I like to kind of think of that way. Like you have to, like if you think about your say raw text data or other kinds of qualitative data as, I don't want to say shape less, but like very yeah. unstructured yeah. in their shape. If you're going to do, if you're going to do some kind of analysis, any kind of analysis, you you have to, transform that that text that other or other kind of qualitative data into an appropriate data structure for whatever it is you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So I think I've been thinking about this actually because so the the first book that I wrote with um Dave with David Robinson mm -hmm. um uh text mining with R is the name of it and it's a book that's really about um EDA like exploratory data analysis but for text. Mm -hmm. 
and it, it, it adopts a, an opinionated, um, kind of an opinionated take that, that, uh, having your, text data, transforming it into a tidy data format where, say, you have one observation per row, mm-hmm. um, that sets you up on this, this, that sets you up for success in terms of, in terms of the task of exploratory data analysis, whether that's, um, uh, you know, I need to summarize, I need to visualize. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so that, that tidy data structure is one that uh, sets you up for being able to flexibly, um, make a, you know, take a lot of different kinds of you know, tasks right. or approaches. And it's good for the same reason that just any kind of tidy data mm-hmm. is good. Right. When it comes to um, training a machine learning model, we, we still, we got to transform, right? Yeah. But often the best, um, the best end shape or data structure for, you know, that we're going to head to is not say something that looks like a table, like a table in a database or like a tidy data frame, but rather that something that looks like um, a matrix, something you can do math mm-hmm. on. Because, you know, basically any of the machine learning algorithms um, are going to are gonna use, you know, some kind of big matrix and do some matrix math or some other, right. you know, kind of, kind of approach there. And so um, there again, we have these the you know this this transformation mm-hmm. that has to happen but it's a bit of a different one yeah. um where we, we need to end up in a different kind of um hmm. uh situation and much like much like um you know say the transformation from raw kind of unstructured text to a tidy data that transformation to a you know something that you might think of as like a document term matrix or or just some kind of matrix representation of it yeah. the decisions that you make um to get from one to the other really impact what you can learn, what, like in, in the literal statistical learning sense yeah. and or the more conceptual, like what am I trying to do here with this, um, with this data? And, and that's like, th- that is really the focus of the book that I wrote. Um, it was published last year. Yes. With um, Emil, Emil, right. uh, Emil Wiefeld. And so that's called um, Supervised Machine Learning for Text Analysis right. in our bit of a mouthful there. <laughs> and and that, like the fully, the first third of the book mm-hmm. is about feature engineering for text, which is just exactly that process of I have unstructured natural language and I need to transform it into a representation mm-hmm. that a machine learning algorithm can, you know, can do math right, on. Right. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people that I, I mean, I, I had a call yesterday with people who, you know, with a team that's, you know, they have qualitative data and they were sort of asking me for help with some of the pieces. And it's like, well, I, you know, if you, if you wanted me to, you know, help you with your bar chart or a map and you sent me a table, you know, of data, I could sort of play around with it. But with qualitative data, I felt like I really need a content expert to go through and tell me what the themes are, right? And um, and I guess if you, yeah, if you can structure that data and pull out the themes using machine learning, you can then sort of share that information with lots of people to say, what's the best way to then represent it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so that, I think that's a really interesting question that I've definitely run into in different um, situations or jobs, that idea of I have unstructured data and what do I do with yeah. it? And I think I would say the two big sort of answers to what can I do with this unstructured data? Like the first big answer I think is yes, content content experts, experts who, domain experts who know something about this um, and I'm going to have them, I'm going to have them label this, I'm going to have them... Um, uh, uh, create themes, um, you know, and, and I've worked with really fantastic, um, you know, UX researchers or qual, uh, qual yes, qualitative mm-hmm. researchers who have this skill of say, um, I'm going to spend, you know, time doing either top down or bottom up kind yeah. of like categorization of what these things are about. And then once we have those um, annotations or labels or right. whatever you want to, you know, put, call that, um, then then we can use that to, you know, maybe you can use that as training data. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can use that um, just, at, at, you know, in, a, in and of itself to be able to learn something. So that's the first sort of 
answer to what am I going to do with un, with um, unstructured data. Yeah. I think the second answer uses uses the sort of like you treat uses quantitative approaches. Mm-hmm. So uses um, uh, something like an unsupervised repro- unsupervised machine learning approach, like. Um, topic modeling or uses some kind of, you know, supervised machine learning approach Mm -hmm. um, to be able to predict some kind of label. And then you, you know, you use these methods of text analysis, like um, tokenization, like, like identifying important words, like you, you basically transform the data, like what I was talking about before, kind of to some, probably some sort of matrix, you know, um, representation, and then use some kind of um, statistical method to be able to learn from From, it. And I think in my experience, those two options, like what is right to choose depends a lot on how much data you have, right? Like if you have, let's say you have less than a thousand, you know, um, uh, uh, observations, yeah. then, then it's like, yeah, you probably are gonna need to read those, yeah. you know, like you're gonna, someone's gonna need to read those and, and, yeah. uh, you know, do some principled qualitative analysis on it. And, you know, you get above about a thousand and then you can start, uh, you know, you can start, um, using some of these quantitative yeah. approaches. Right. The, the thing about text is, um, you know, you say you have a thousand, observations mm-hmm. but the thing you're observing usually is some kind of token like whether that's a single word or something else in there and depending on the vocabulary that people use mm-hmm. in that that can actually mean you don't have a thousand observations you have you have you know maybe many more yeah. observations than that but of not very many um like you haven't observed each thing very many right. times because like the way natural language works, right? Like some words are used, a, there's a few words that are used a lot. Right. And then, and then it's a power law in terms of like there, most of the words are used a very few times. And so you actually haven't observed those words very many times. So depending, it depends on the specifics of the vocabulary right. that people use right. and, and how, how it is used, but truly natural language where people just kind of use all the vocabulary that they have access to um, ends up in a kind of interesting situation for um, let's just call it the counts, like the Rather counts of how many yeah. times you, you observe yeah. different things. Yeah. I'm guessing tokenization is one of those words that's at the tail of that, uh, Tell of that power yes. law, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I've already said it like right. three times. Right, but so, it'll be the yeah. only time in all the transcripts of this show that it'll occur. So, you know, it's, it's right. Right, right. Um, okay, so all right. of this, I think, segues very nicely into your current work, which is on the Vetiver package. And this is not an area that I am familiar with. So I am just going to ask you to explain it to me because I'm guessing people who are listening to this are also not as familiar with it. But I think there's a, it sounds like it's got the combination of all the things you've talked about. If I'm, if I'm understanding, it's got the workflow piece. Uh, it's got the open source piece, obviously. And it's got the text and the machine learning. And it's, it seems by my reading of it, it's working all of those into this like complete kind of, or maybe it's uh, closing the circle on the workflow. Yeah, yeah. I like thinking about it that way. I So this is something that um, I've been talking about since I was hired, mm, actually, okay. at our studio. Um, one of the things that um, – one of the things – that we talked about when I was hired would, was okay. You're going to come. You're going to work on tidy models packages. But one one of the thing one of the areas that we know, for example, we you know we would get we get questions about um, when it you know when we would do trainings on tidy models. Mm-hmm. It's like okay, well once I have my trained model, what do I do with it? Right. Like if I have some kind of predictive model or. Um, you know, some kind of like machine learning model. What is it that I do when I'm done? Um, and there is this uh, narrative that, you know, R is not good for production. R is not good for um, real work right, yeah. or work that you need to scale, yeah. something that you need to scale. And, um, uh, but it, it turns out actually that some of those t- same tasks are, are difficult in Python as well. Mm-hmm. Like um, the the difference is maybe not as 
big as, um, you know, some people expect or would like to see that the process of taking a Python model and putting it into production is actually also fairly difficult. Actually, also, there's a lot of questions around what do you do? What are good practices? And um, so as I spent more time at at our studio, it really, so I expressed interest, Mm -hmm. right, in like working on these kinds of these kinds of tools, because I think, and, there, and you're exactly right, that a big reason why it appeals to me is that I do love working on really applied yeah. problems, on really, um, uh, really practical kind of um, sets of tools mm-hmm. or sets of uh, analyses that people have. Right. And this, this sort of <clears throat> you know, you, you've trained a model, let's say you, you use really good, you know, s- s- statistical practices to do a great job training a model that is um, a reliable and robust and you can, you know, you understand its predictions. But that, that question of like, what, what, do you do afterwards yeah. with that model is, um, is, is where vetiver sits. Okay. So vetiver does not, um, is not about developing a model. Mm-hmm. Vetiver is about, um, uh, what you might call model ops or ML ops tasks. So these are tasks like versioning your model. Um, these are tasks like deploying your model and, uh, these are tasks like monitoring your model. Gotcha. So your model is, done being trained and and not all models are deployed right yeah. like some models are trained uh, in in the book with max we kind of outline like a uh, an ontology of models where like models can be built for different purposes some models are built um to describe just to just as like to describe data some models are built um for inter- inferential purposes mm-hmm. say you want to look at the um you want to look at the, say, the coefficients of the model, and use. Um, uh, t- you want to you want to communicate something, or explain, or understand some situation based on the um, on the on the coefficients of the model. Mm-hmm. And then, and then uh, another big reason why models are trained are um, to be predictive, to be predictive models. And that's typically where, like, it's not very useful to have a predictive model and not be able to deploy it somewhere (laughs) (laughs) and, and put it into quote production. And, you know, like people, I think also talk about like hear that and either feel scared or confused. They're like, what does production mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What does does it mean? What does it mean? what does it mean to put a model into production? But just like, what does production mean in general? Mm -hmm. One way I like to think about production is that your, in this case, model um, is, is portable in the sense that you don't, Say you trained it, say, on the computer sitting on your Mm -hmm. desk, right? And so you have that model on the computer on your desk. Mm -hmm. But um, to put it into production is to make it useful in a different computational environment, Mm -hmm. like to make it useful in to other users than you. Right. So so in kind of by that definition, um, one way you could think about or visualize putting a model into production is say like um, building a shiny app that allows people to like human beings to kind of like move sliders or change, mm-hmm. you know, change inputs and to see what does the model predict? Mm-hmm. Like if I do this, what does the model predict and to get a prediction right. out? So, and then if you, de- if you, you know, deploy that shiny app somewhere, like you put that shiny app somewhere, I would call that putting a model into production. Right. Most often when people put models in production, what they're doing is they're putting, they're making their model available, not necessarily to a person to um, be able to, say, move a slider and see how the prediction changes, but probably to make that, the predictions of that model available to IT infrastructure. So say, say, um, you know, you have... Um, you have, say, a business selling widgets and you want to, you know, you want to have some, um, some, some, a model that like helps you decide, um, predict what, what What? is the most likely widget that, um, you know, this customer wants. And so you, you don't necessarily want a person to go and look, but rather you want, 
uh, in a more automated way mm -hmm. for whatever system that's facing the customer to be able to say, oh, hey, um, this is the one I think that is the best right. or like, like here's the highest probability um, category mm -hmm. or whatever that this person is, is interested in. And so usually when people say put a model into production, what they mean is they like take the model, package it up and make it available um, so that um, – the, uh, the systems that you have um, can interact with the model and get out what they need. And if you ever heard the term microservices, what that means is just like, like let's separate those things out so that each one of them is its own little piece computer, oh, basically. I see. You know, its own little, its own little piece, right. right? So that you don't have them all together in one system, gotcha. but like the system that you know, uh, get like shows the customer something is separate from the system that makes the prediction, but they all they can all, like talk, talk to each other. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. And the, and the way that most of these things talk to each other, um, in, in most situations is, is by restful APIs. So like if you've ever, you know, said like, Ooh, I'm going to use say in our, like the hitter package mm -hmm. and I'm going to, I'm going to do a, get requests or a post request like you use http calls mm -hmm. to for one system to be able to talk to the other system so that's that's when when most people say put a model in production that's usually what they mean okay. they want they want to have the model somewhere um, so that other parts of your infrastructure can say make an http call and get back the um the predictions, the predictions from that first part so and, and then on the version control so does that ever have a version control embedded within within it or or do you need to also be using like a github type solution to also have that piece? So so git so this is an interesting question. How do you version data? How yeah. do you version models? So let's talk about just models. Um git can be used to version models, but they sometimes get a little big yeah. um, because you don't, it's not like text. They're not plain text. They're usually binary objects. Yeah. And if you update it, like you retrain it with new data, it's not like text where you're like, ah, let me, I can diff it right. and I can see that this line has changed. Right. No, the whole binary file has yeah. changed. And so get, um, can be used for that kind of purpose, big. but it's, it gets big and it sometimes it's not very, you know, you don't, you don't get like the reasons why you would typically use Git because um, of all the diffing, all the line by line, all that kind of thing. Like it doesn't really apply to a model. Mm -hmm. So there are some tools that use Git um, for versioning data and or models. Mm -hmm. One that I like is called DVC, data version control, but that's actually not the approach that we took. So we took an approach that's a little bit more, um, like think about you have a way to fi store files somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then let's just put like a little bit of a layer on top of that so that you can version, so that you can version and like have access to all the versions you mm -hmm. need in the past, attach kind of some, mm, some metadata. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's like appropriate metadata for a model. And, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> and that, um, that, 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 that you can kind of switch out backends in kind of a flexible gotcha. way. So so we use it's it's actually the same approach that the pins package takes. Mm -hmm. So pins is a there's an R and Python version of pins and it's it's um the metaphor here is like you have a board, mm -hmm. like like picture a bulletin board, and then you pin things to the board. Right. And then it's like, oh, it's time for me to make a new version of that. You kind of like pin a new version on top, top of the of old version. Gotcha. Yeah. And so huh. the there the um the sort of what where are you actually keeping it is quite flexible. Like you can you can sure. um pin, you can write a pin to a um like a cloud platform's blob storage like s3 or azure blob storage or something mm -hmm. like that you can use if you're a if you use like our studios pro products you can use connect mm -hmm. as like 
the storage device. Like here's where we come and get these versioned um, storage pieces. You can use like if you're in a situation where say you have a shared network drive or something, like you can, you can use, use that. that. And the so it's all the same. It looks the same yeah. to the user, but you are deciding where is it that that that, that this goes. Yeah. So it's a little bit of a um, bespoke versioning approach mm -hmm. that is meant to have flexible backends and give you just the right amount of um, abstraction around mm -hmm. it where it's um, uh, straightforward to get the right version. It's straightforward to share it with the right, you know, sets of users, yeah. um, that type of thing. So do you now, um, do you now get to, or do you, do you and your team try to work with, I would, I don't know. I mean, our studio clients, I guess, to see how they're implementing it and what, like where the, you know, blockages are and, you know, where, where they need improvements. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's a super valuable um, piece of feedback for us. We work on open source, you know, yeah. I am on the open source team, right. right? So we, like me and my team work on open source software, right, right. but because it is so much about, um, Deployment, right, deployment, which is which is really about like where does my data artifact and work like where does it finally come into contact yeah. with the infrastructure that I'm working on like so so it really does um, involve yeah. uh, like like you know very like we've I've been saying very applied very practical like how are people really doing yeah. this and yeah so before. Um, kind of very early in the process of all of this, like I spent some time doing, doing a round of user interviews. Like I had a little like, um, you know, questionnaire I had, I had put together to try to understand what were people doing now? What mm -hmm. was working for them? What was not working for them? Where did they see their, their, you know, pain points or points of, um, like, like where was collaboration yes, not working? Kind of like falling where apart. was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And though those I, I so appreciate all the people who are willing to talk to me. So that was a mix of people who are our studio customers mm -hmm. and um people who are from the community who were, right. you know, had been, you know, trying to say put a model into production. Right. And I, I really appreciate um those people's um you know time and expertise and perspectives because it did it did inform mm -hmm. Um, you know, what we eventually decided to build, yeah. um, which, which, you know, is different than some of the other options that are out there in that it's really flexible what you bring, like what kind of model you bring is um, like where we kind of put the, I guess the hooks, like the, the, where do you kind of enter into this process? Yeah. Like, like we built that to be very, flexible hopefully we have the options for say the 80 percent case and then then it's extensible and um customizable for say the and i mean that in like a real right no, no no right way. right for, for <laughs> multiple teams doing multiple different things and yeah, you mentioned yeah. earlier sort of like having this piece and this piece and this piece that's not just tools right that's people working in their own little pieces and to try to resolve that or fix that it's like a good old industrial organization challenge that yeah yeah no for sure yeah. for sure yeah and so that was that was all early and then since we have had something to show people mm -hmm. we've been doing um you know we do pretty regular demos or you know getting feedback kind of sessions where we show people like say a demo and say what questions do you have about it yeah. what do you think would work about this what are you still looking for, you know, and not that we can do, we can be everything to everybody because oh, right. we, you know, we, we can't, right. we can't, but like to understand what the most common um, use cases are yeah. or difficulties. Right. Um, so one last question for you, are you making Vetiverse t-shirts? Cause that's <laughs> like the obvious extension of it that's right entering the vetiverse, that's right. right i mean yes the uh yes yes i actually <laughs> so so it's so it's a real word okay it's a real word vetiver it is an ingredient in um in perfumery so if you're like i'm i i am i'm into perfume and i'm into like fancy candles okay. you know and so if you like if any of your listeners are like vetiver i feel like i've seen that right. or heard that somewhere it probably is from like a fancy candle okay. or something like right. that so it is 
is a it's a stabilizing ingredient in um, perfume. Huh. Um, it does smell good on its own, but like its main purpose that is used for is that like uh, you know if you take like more volatile kind of you know scents and fragrances, right. vetiver will help stabilize ah. them so they don't just like you know, go away and evaporate right. off. And so the, and so the metaphor here is right. Like vetiver helps you stabilize your, your models, models here right, are yeah. like these, are these like sort of more, um, volatile kind of components and vetiver stabilizes it so that, you know, you have, you know, the version you need, right. it is reliably deployed in a way that you can, you know, get to the predictions and also you can monitor, um, how it's doing over time. Gotcha. So in doing research on this before deciding for sure on the name, yeah. um, it was it was kind of appealing that it was a bit of an unusual word, yep. right? There's not a ton <laughs> out there, but I think there is something out there called the Vetiverse because I think there's like a there's like a band or oh, something okay. with the same name, but it's it's a pretty uncommon. Yeah. Um, okay, but if I'm word. ever out and I see like a perfume store or a candle store with the with name vetiverse i i'm gonna expect you to be in there just like selling <laughs> your like custom-made candles and stuff yeah with right. our That's with right. our studio stickers like on the bottom of it with the price or something like that yeah. perfect perfect <laughs> i love that <laughs> um julia thanks so much this was really interesting i mean not uh i yeah i mean i just learned a lot i'll just say that um really fascinating stuff um congrats on getting it out and i'm excited to see how it starts to be picked up and find itself into the open source community and see, and see what folks do with it. It'll be really interesting to see. Um, yeah. We're super excited about that too. Right. Well, thanks again for coming on the show. It's been great chatting. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks everyone for tuning into this week's episode of the show. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you'll check out all of Julia's work on her website at our studio and in the R uh, packaging language. Um, I put links to all of his packages that we talked about and her books in the show notes. So I hope you'll check that out. And I hope you'll check out policyviz.com where you can learn more about visualizing and communicating your data. So until next time, this has been the Policy Viz podcast. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>